Very good. So welcome to our session on, uh, on basically on methods and methodologies um, with regard to the three topics that have just been introduced. Um, we have uh, one hour, which will be split between short presentations on the one hand, and then a and Q&A uh, to, in, to integrate uh, questions, concerns, comments from the audience. Um, we have four short presentations. The first one is uh, by Nawazi Mkwanazi. Uh, she is a, a medical anthropologist who is interested in issues relating to gender and the politics of reproduction. She received her doctorate at Cambridge University um, and teaches courses in anthropology of medicine and the body, medical anthropology and ethnographic writing. Over the past two decades, uh, she has conducted long-term ethnographic research on early childbearing, kinship and care, uh, which is a subject of her current book manuscript. Uh, no, uh, Nawazi, can I ask you to present uh, for approximately five minutes? Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, this session is about methodological challenges. And in South Africa, given that we've been encouraged to remain at home since lockdown in late March, the research for the project that I'm talking about has actually not begun yet. But what I'm gonna to present to you are actually the conditions that we face. So let me begin by saying that I'm interested in issues of care and caregiving in marginalized urban South African communities. While care is actually a very difficult concept um, to define, what I'm interested in is family-based care rather than the care that actually happens in biomedical facilities. So specifically during COVID-19, um, I'm interested in questions about who provides care under what conditions is this care provided and what are the circumstances of the caregiver? So to address one of the questions that we've been set, which is um, how COVID-19 will shape the social life of marginalized communities, uh, well, of, in my case, um, marginalized urban communities in South Africa, let me begin by first painting a picture of how things were before we entered lockdown. Before lockdown, the majority of care with regard to young people, um, with people living with disabilities, with the sick and the elderly actually took place in households and was provided by family members. This care work was deeply gendered. And usually when a family was faced with a sudden health crisis, household members and family members usually made decisions which actually balanced the particular care needs and demands against particular economic needs and opportunities. They often made decisions which took into account time and income constraints. They also considered long-term issues which included education and the well-being and security of children. And in the decisions that were reached, it was usually common for a relatively healthy or older female household member to take on their everyday care and higher care needs of co-resident children, of frail older people, and of other people requiring assistance. Um, the, the burden of care was also usually alleviated by intra and extra familial care relationships and resources both within households and among households connected through family ties. So the availability of these networks and resources actually had a significant impact on the health status of people who were in need of um, care and also those who were in kind of poor health situations. It also importantly had a great impact on the well-being of carers themselves. So during COVID-19, what has not changed is that women continue to be at the forefront of fighting the virus and caring for those who are infected. But what COVID-19 has presented us with is actually a situation where people aren't able to effectively call upon these networks 
due to the actual COVID-19 containment measures, which include things like physical distancing, a ban on family visits, and a ban of, on travel across provinces. Therefore, caregivers are actually providing care under conditions of relative isolation. In South Africa, the recently estimated loss of 3 million jobs due to COVID-19, and with 40% of households having lost their main source of income, an increasing number of households have actually been pushed into abject poverty. This affects the kinds of decisions people are making given their already precarious livelihoods. So in the next 12 months, um, what kind of challenges can one encounter in research, specifically in this research on care and caregiving? As we know, caregiving is very demanding, physically, financially, and emotionally. And most caregivers actually care under very stressful conditions, which has an effect on their mental well-being. With the rise in the loss of jobs, the uncertainty about the future, and the possibility of infection and death, especially for those with compromised health. Caring for people with chronic illness during the COVID-19 pandemic is without a doubt quite stressful. Caregivers and care recipients are usually assumed to be separate categories, but a person who is responsible for care might actually also herself be in need of care. So most caregivers tend to be older, and while they may provide high level care to others, it is often that their own health care is actually compromised or declining. And this makes them quite vulnerable to adverse outcomes if infected. So what we're seeing presently is a rise in infections. And in the coming weeks, there will be many deaths. Um, and many of these are expected to occur within township communities. People will actually need to turn their focus to the work of mourning and burying the dead and actually finding the resources to do this, which will leave little time for um, them to engage in research. With regard to what funders can do to maximize the impact of research, essentially it would be to encourage projects in the natural sciences to engage more with the social sciences from the very beginning. Because as anthropologists, our knowledge of communities is often accumulated through spending long periods of time interacting with people. While we cannot predict future responses, most anthropologists can at least provide insight into why particular interventions may be successful and others not. As well as possibly suggest ways of treating people whose already precarious lives have been upended by COVID-19 in ways which accord them respect and dignity. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nolwasi. Um, we move straight to the second presentation. And after the four presentations, we will then open up uh, for discussion. Um, our second speaker is uh, Wesley Schramm, uh, a, a sociology prof professor at LSU. His primary interest is in sociology of science and technology, particularly in the, develop, uh, in, the, uh, in the developing world. Since the early 1990s, he has been examining communication networks, in particular the role of the internet in Africa and Asia. Um, he focused mainly on Kenya, Ghana, and Kerala, which is indeed in the southwest of um, India. Um, uh, Wesley, you have about five minutes. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you especially, Nawazi, for uh, going ahead and giving a, a couple of my points. Um, I, I will simply endorse, endorse your talk in that, in that case. So uh, what I have done here is to basically try to get fairly quickly to the question that I have for the WHO or any other funders. Uh, we, my, my basic project has been going since 1994 in Kenya, Ghana, and India, and the uh, focus has been communication media and social networks, and so that's kind of my specialty area. In 2014, we were in West Africa uh, during the uh, Ebola outbreak, and this caused us to change our focus a bit. So we began studying Ebola in 
Africa and later expanded to a couple of other countries. That wound up uh, on the heels, you know, right in, in front of the Zika epidemic. So we added three Latin American countries, Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico, and, and did some, some work there. And finally have come up uh, with a new project for COVID. And this is funded by the National Science Foundation. We're doing a study of eight, uh, it was supposed to be eight countries. Now uh, three countries have sort of volunteered to be included um, in, that, in that process. And uh, we uh, now I guess we're going to either find more money or spread it thin because now we're so we're at 11 countries now. But our framework is based on our Ebola Zika study. And this is using the concept of what we call um, epidemic fire. Epidemic fire is the way in which people interact with epidemics. And the uh, the idea of locative fear, which is fear of a fear of locations, fear of spaces, and fear of people who aren't sick, which we now call asymptomatic persons in the case of coronavirus. And so it worked out very well that we published this paper, Who's Afraid of Ebola, right during this pandemic now. This is, this is where we're coming from conceptually. Now, what we're doing in this 11 country study is to focus on five groups who will be nurses, teachers, the unemployed, small business people, like what, what they call the informal sector, and also recovered corona patients. So we've got those five groups and we're focusing on some of our typical areas, which are where do you get your information and what is your social network like? But we are also you know, facing some challenges and we, we have some questions for some funders as well. Uh, so as far as the impacts on these groups that we're studying, I'm gonna just endorse Nawasi, I don't know. We haven't done the study yet. Uh, secondly is be the major challenges, which will be the field work challenges that we have not been able to get into the field and we are a bit worried about the safety of our interviewers as well and uh, can't really get started yet. But it's okay because it's, we, we felt that ultimately it was better to study the coronavirus episode as a whole and not simply jump into the field. Well, it was right starting first. You know, we wanted to get out in the field in April. No, we're going to wait until it's sort of not over, but at least until the first primary waves have passed. So, uh, of course, these are different for the different countries. Uh, finally, we have a very big challenge because the darn thing has gone on so long that the survey now is way too long. So what's the maximum impact that we can make? That is going to be our big question that we have for the funding agents. And we have, uh, here's, here's the deal. Just the, the, final, the final point here is we have, we have figured out what we think are three important aspects. One is the precautions that people are taking all over the world, we're gonna study them in 11 countries. What are the precautions? We started with a list of, we've made it up to 70, 70 different precautionary things that were being done. And we've said, no, nope, too long for a survey. We got it down to about 30. I'd be very interested in the WHO's opinion on before we go forward and start this. Secondly, separate part of the survey, the same issues, what recommendations have people heard what have the experts told them? What have their governments told them? Okay, so actually the same list of things. Okay, finally, the third thing is what, and this is really tricky survey wise, how burdensome and necessary are those same list of items? How burdensome and necessary are they? Because we cannot help during this current pandemic. It's by the time we collect our data, it's going to be largely over. And that's, that's when we want to collect our data. But we want to know what is the relationship between these three different dimensions, the precautions people are in fact taking, the recommendations that they have in fact heard or been told to follow, and thirdly, how burdensome and necessary are those actions or inactions in the case of stay at home. So that's where we are. Uh, that, those are the big questions that we have. Those are our challenges and that's our um, way forward. Thanks very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Leslie. Uh, our third speaker is from McGill University uh, at the Faculty of Medicine. He's David Buckeridge. He is interested in automated surveillance to detect disease outbreaks and to guide public health interventions. His research involves the development of methods for conducting and evaluating automated surveillance. Uh, David, the floor is yours for approximately five minutes. Thank you very much, Max. So um, I'll follow on this theme a little bit that Wesley started around media, but get a bit more come at it from a bit of a different angle. My background is in medical informatics, so I'm not a social scientist, but I do work uh, with um, some folks in bioethics as well as people in computer science and infectious diseases on this project. And uh, we were fortunate to be funded quite early, actually, in uh, in March by the Canadian Institutes for Health Research. Uh, in their initial funding round, they got up quite quickly to support uh, research around COVID. Uh, and we were funded to look at uh, using online news media to track interventions uh, put in place around the world, non-pharmaceutical interventions to control COVID-19, uh, and to the extent possible, to try to uh, look at the uh, reaction of different communities around the world to those interventions using uh, online media. So this builds on a strategy to surveillance that's well developed. It's called event-based surveillance. Most people are familiar with indicator-based surveillance, uh, where we count cases of disease and, and cases of death. Uh, we try to come up with sort of accurate indicators from an epidemiologic perspective in different countries. Event-based surveillance came up in parallel or grew up in parallel over the last decade or so as a way to sort of circumvent the official reporting hierarchy through countries and take advantage of online media sources to mainly rapidly detect epidemics. And there's a number of systems that have been put in place around the world. One of the earliest was something called the Global Public Health Intelligence Network, or GFIN, developed by Health Canada, which was used by World Health Organizations and others. And there's been other systems developed by academic groups such as HealthMap and BioCast, and also in the European Union. And most recently, the WHO has put in place a program called Epidemic Intelligence from Open Sources to try and coordinate amongst these different systems. And all these systems work in essentially the same way. They obtain large feeds of digital news media from uh, resellers of new, new media feeds like Factivia, Meltwater, Google News, things like that. And they use very sensitive keywords, uh, queries, to try to pull in information relevant to public health emergencies. After that, different uh, natural language processing or, or artificial intelligence methods are used to try to actually detect, usually within individual media reports, uh, different mentions of things like geography, symptoms, diseases, and so on. But generally, a really small set of, of entities are, are, are usually recognized by these systems. And then the final step is that some estimate or prediction is made as to whether or not an individual report is of relevance. So this means, for example, is it a story about the pandemic now, or is it a story about the 1918 pandemic? Uh, that's not really talking about current news, but really more of a kind of historical perspective. It's not uh, breaking news, if you will. So those are the three kind of steps. Get the data online, do some kind of entity recognition, looking for geography, disease, other characteristics of, of terms within uh, each report, and then try and predict their relevance. But uh, a relatively large uh, review of these systems uh, found that, that that approach was actually kind of missing the connecting the dots. So people were presented with a large number of, of reports that had been media reports that had been flagged as being about uh, one disease or another in one country or another. Um, but there was really not much synthesis around those data. And so what we wanted to try and be able to do was to actually use more modern machine learning techniques to, to really try and look not just at individual reports, but at topics that are emerging in these uh, different reports, particularly uh, as, they try, as they work to identify or report on different non-pharmaceutical interventions that have been implemented and how communities around the world seem to be reacting to those different interventions using this, this more richer approach to modeling topics. Uh, in, in, the, in the news media. And so that's in fact the approach we took is something called uh, topic modeling or dynamic topic modeling, uh, which uh, I won't go into great detail, but I, anybody that's interested, I can provide links to. This is a, a paper that was just accepted for publication. So the, the methodology is well described there. But essentially we can look at how topics evolve in media, uh, both by things like country, for example, or also by different types of media source, by official media, for example, from uh, governments and World Health Organization, or from unofficial uh, news media, uh, which is the main source used. And when we analyzed uh, data that we obtained uh, from uh, both the Global, Global Public Health Intelligence Network in Canada and also the World Health Organization attempt to uh, document the implementation of non-pharmaceutical interventions around the world, we were able to identify a number of interesting uh, topics uh, that, that change over time. 
uh, the, perhaps the, 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 the strongest uh, sort of support we found was for a set of five topics, which related to social distancing, uh, related to protective equipment, health systems, travel restrictions, and research activities. And when we, we, we tried to correlate these topics with the actual uh, articles that had been manually flagged in terms of whether they were different uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions, and we saw very high correlations from those topics and, and the uh, different types of interventions they were meant to represent, which gave us uh, some comfort that this approach is actually picking up the signals that we hope it is. Uh, what's also nice about this methodology is we can also, once these topics have been identified, we can also look at how they, they change over time. For example, which topics tend to become more or less important. And as I mentioned before, we can do this by stratifying by countries over time, but also by different media sources over time, which uh, also provides some interesting insights. So to summarize, we've, we've extended, I think, what are kind of relatively uh, strong, but uh, kind of report focused, if you will, or individual media report methods for, for looking at uh, public health events within uh, online media. And we've put in place a, what I would consider a bit more of a robust strategy that looks across different reports and tries to elicit or, or identify topics that are relevant with a primary particular focus on non-pharmaceutical interventions to control COVID-19. And we've showed that we can identify those uh, interventions being put in place with some accuracy, and we can identify the topics that tend to change over time and across countries in relation to those interventions. Uh, there's a number of limitations and challenges. Uh, one, which I think is very rich for the social sciences literature or perspective, sorry, is, is the actual terminology that's being used around interventions. Is it really consistent? We talk about different things like lockdown, and we talk about things like even case finding and, and, and case uh, trick contact tracing. Are these really the same things in different countries? Uh, we're starting to also look at the issue that different media sources, of course, come with different biases and frame articles in different ways. Uh, we're also interested in looking at issues of temporality in terms of you know, when we see mentions in media versus official news and what's the interplay amongst those two. So there are many challenges there uh, in terms of digging into those issues and, and being able to extract the relevant concepts uh, from the text. Uh, in our future work, we'll be looking at, at trying to dig into those issues at uh, getting larger, uh, more representative data sets, and also looking to understand to what extent these data can be used together with other kinds of data sources for surveillance to provide a richer picture of what's going on around uh, implementation of non-pharmaceutical interventions and community responses to them. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, I just acknowledge that this is work by my research group, as well as the research group in computer science and another group uh, in bioethics uh, and epidemiology. Uh, and once again, thank the CIHR for their funding to allow us to get off, uh, up and running quite quickly, have some initial results already, but uh, still much more work to be done. And I'm looking forward uh, to the discussion that we might have uh, in this session and afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Uh, our final input uh, will be provided by Chisomo Kalinga. Uh, she is affiliated with the University of Edinburgh, specifically the so uh, Social Anthropology Department. Her interests include medical humanities, illness narratives, narrative medicine, disease as metaphor, um, arts and humanities-based research methodologies, and participant action research. Uh, we are looking forward to your five minute input presentation. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you to the other speakers. And one of the difficulties of coming last is I have to amend so much of what I said because Nolwazi, uh, Wesley and David had said, hit so many of the points much better than I could. So I wanted to focus on some of the, I guess, real time issues that I've been noticing and I've been struggling with and I've also spoken with my colleagues um, here in Malawi, um, but also at my, I'm, I'm based at a research institute in the global north and I think that that paradigm is something that has to be discussed as well. So I take in some of the three structural questions that were proposed in, in terms of, you know, dividing as what Nawazi had accurately uh, framed as care and the way it's shaping the social life of communities. And to start by saying that one of the struggles I had is that in the last three weeks, Malawi went from having something like 500 to 700 cases to having now 3,000 today. And it has vastly changed the scope of how this um, discussion has evolved. 
that it started off as a slow burn, that there were some implementations that seemed to work quite well, having an immediate border closure, for example. And so we started to see that a lot of the stories and st stigmas and stereotypes that were being addressed were focused on some of the wealthier communities, people who are flying in and bringing disease. And just last week, we're seeing that the, that has completely changed. And now there's a lot of stigma being attributed to anybody who's sick because they, they're seen as someone who is going to disrupt the ability for people to go and um, work, bring money for families and to conduct their livelihood. So there's a lot of open space here. There's a lot of unanswered questions. And I was very hesitant to kind of say affirmatively that what is going to happen or how things are evolving because things are changing so rapidly, especially as the disease is progressing. So the one thing which I also wanted to commiserate with um, Nawazi is that family has always been central in healthcare. Even at hospitals, if you're hospitalized, you're, you're normally they're designated for members of your family who will bring you food, help you bathe. All of this has been disrupted. So we're looking at a new wave of anxieties that we're now seeing as um, hospitals. One of the first things they did was to block that to prevent family members from um, contracting the virus and spreading it back to other family members and communities. So we're looking at a massive shift, massive disruptions that we're going to begin to see, we're, we're only now beginning to see how they're going to shape the social lives of communities. People not having direct access to the hospitals and not being able to report back to families how the patient is coping, how they are doing, whether they're receiving adequate cares. And they're already beginning to cause anxieties in communities, especially if the case results in a death, there's a lot of questions. No one was there to document it. How was the person treated? Were they cared for adequately? So in the Malawian context, there's, there's a lot of emerging issues that are structured around care that only now we're, we're really three weeks into the heat of, of um, the mass spread. So I think there is definitely a lot of scope for social scientists and people in humanities to begin to modify some of the things which we thought, especially some of the ideas that we thought this would be a slow burn as opposed to how it was progressing in other countries. So I, I wanted to focus a bit on that aspect in terms of the practicalities of challenges in research. Um, one of the concerns that have emerged in the discussions is, you know, I think science research has a different trajectory in terms of its evolution from start to finish that doesn't match in a timeline of social science research. And David had just mentioned that about, you know, documenting and changing over time, that these are huge issues. And the concerns, I think, in the field are, you know, I think the science community has listened quite well in terms of understanding that social science research is necessary and bringing in a social scientist research to tag into some of these funded projects. Now, the problem is that social scientists are now kind of being held to the timelines of, of doing these projects. So if there was any projects that started in March earlier and have just concluded, we're now kicking off into the epidemic. And I think that we need to be able to incorporate that things are changing so rapidly that there needs to be flexibility in amending some of the social science research and understanding that the temporal space that it's going to operate in is going to be vastly different than science. The stigmas are going to be changing rapidly. The concerns, the anxieties, the discourses, the narratives, the metaphors that they're going to evolve. Um, even everything down to the localized and vernacular language of trying to struggle to find a word in Chichewa for lockdown. You know, these are all things that have been emerging. Like, how do you explain to the ordinary person about lockdown? But also the home life of people in communities is vastly different. Um, more communal, people eating together, sharing, and these are things that we're going to have to disrupt. So as researchers, as you know, how do we adequately document this when we are restricted? A lot of us are working from home, but we have been told by our ethics and research councils that we're not allowed to interact with communities for very practical reasons of safety. But it creates challenges of how do we go about doing something which is building trust with the communities to get the data that we need to make sure we understand. So what a lot of people are doing is they're, you know, if, if they have this capacity, is focusing on their own families and their own communities where they do have limited access, where they do have trust, if, you know, if assuming that they do have trust in their own families and communities. 
that a lot of the early research, especially during this period of lockdown, is going to be built and framed up upon a lot of unorthodox methods of staying connected with our communities and our families because these are the only uh, sources that we have connection to. There has been lots of discourse about building creative ways of how to do ethnographic research from your home. I don't really see how that's quite possible with indigenous and remote communities. There has to be some sort of engagement. Um, I, I found that it's quite difficult to kind of pry this information over the phone. Normally that's where you come and you sit down. So I think there are a lot of challenges about being realistic that the type of data that we're going to get as we are in lockdown is going to be vastly different than what's going to happen when we emerge and when we have access from communities. So I think that in terms of what research funders can do is to acknowledge that we are in new territory that even with other diseases such as the AIDS epidemic, which unraveled much slower over a course of years and didn't require this sort of physical barriers to emerge within, even within households, that there's going to be a need for adaptability and to understand that researchers are going to have to change and shift rapidly based upon uh, changing structures. Um, and in that sense, you know, Wesley had brought up a really good point, which is where do you get your information? I mean, even for myself, how I'm getting my information, as I said before, is as an as ethnographer, I've had to do some, you know, you use whatever analytical ethnographic praxis, even beginning with eavesdropping on family, and then looking more between deeper connections between eavesdropping to general listening and understanding and getting a better sense of how the language uses reflecting concerns and anxieties and fears and knowledge transmission between people. So I think for me, what I see is that there has to be flexibility, there has to be adaptability. And there also has to be something which is acknowledging structural knowledge and who are custodians of cultural knowledge. Those of us who are researchers who are going to be confined to our home have to begin to form, form networks with people who are in rural communities who are custodians of knowledge and have better concept of real time discussions and concerns and languages and vocabulary that are developing in ways that we simply don't have access to because because we're being confined to our homes for obviously, I, I always repeat, very practical reasons for our safety and for the safety community that we are working with. And I think in that sense, to kind of tie it to the concern that I had was we still haven't really addressed as a global health paradigm, a global health community, the kind of paradigm of Global North funding emanating and, and then kind of tokenistic inclusion of Africans to incorporate knowledge of what's happening on the ground. And I think that this is a major concern that still has to be addressed, that much of the major funding is still emanating from Global North researchers, and then it's trickling down into, into connections. Um, so I think I'll just leave it there because I'm seeing that there's it's time for discussion, but um, that's where I'll leave it is there has to be more practical measures to understand who is a custodian of knowledge and who's being entrusted to collect and write about this information. Thank you so much, Chisomo. And uh, we have a huge challenge. This is an incredible, rich background. And I would like to open now the discussion, uh, reminding people that this session is primarily on methods and methodology, but of course it is only an artificial separation between substance and methods. So I do realize that. So please, um raise your virtual hand for now i don't see anyone so i will maybe ask a question myself um, um to what extent do the four presenters um to what extent do you feel that um, the um,
Okay, I, I got kicked out. Am I back in again? You are, yes. Ah, okay, thank you. So, um, so to I what think extent, we all got kicked out, actually. All right, to, to what extent are, is, are you currently dealing with uh, COVID more in terms of needing to adjust the research design? Uh, maybe possibly even the research question and the focus, or to what extent are you more dealing with having to adapt, let us say, uh, data collection and uh, consequently data analysis methods? Uh, David here, I can start if you like, Max. Or no? Uh, I know that I don't hear David. I'm here now. No. No way. Hmm. Max, this is Morgan. I can hear David and yourself. Huh. Somebody may actually have to take over because I don't hear anyone speaking other than I don't, I don't hear David, actually. Hi, David, this is Morgan. I would be great if you could um, begin the conversation and in the meantime, we'll um, do our best to make um, everyone visible and get Max reconnected. Sure, can you hear me, Morgan? I can, uh, yes. I hear oh, David, okay. oh, very good. Oh, we're coming back, I think. Yeah, I was coming in and out there. It was uh, not sure what happened. Okay. Too much interest, I guess. <laughs> Looks good from my side too, thanks. Okay, yeah, so just to respond to your question, Max, I mean, I think uh, my project sounds maybe a bit different than the other ones we heard presented. Uh, we were, we literally got off the ground. Uh, actually, fortunately, we already had already started work in this area and I was already engaged with the WHO and other groups in terms of doing research on these kinds of systems. Uh, when when our, our national funding agency put out a call uh, in February or actually early March, um, we, we were able to pivot as, as it were, uh, given that we were already working with these kinds of surveillance systems to, to reframe our question to be more around COVID-19. And then the question around interventions and, and trying to be able to look at community reactions became very interesting. Um, so it wasn't terribly challenging. The most challenging thing for us really has been the, the fact that things are un unfolding in real time. And so, you know, trying to validate anything or know where things are really gonna go is, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to do until they actually happen and then you have to kind of roll it back and look at it. So I think that speaks to the timelines that were discussed before uh, uh, in terms of, you know, this type of research. It, it's, it's, it's a little easier if things have already happened. You look back in retrospect and you can have time to understand the real implications. And so that's been maybe our biggest challenge, I would say. Mm -hmm. I see that Holtin is um, uh, raising his or her hand, it's not clear from the abbreviation. Yeah, hello, it's Andreas Holt from the EU Commission, um, DGRTD Research and Innovation um, Research Infrastructures. And I'm very much interested in that part that Norvazi mentioned, mentioned at the beginning. I think there was this claim that uh, funders should acknowledge that uh, natural sciences uh, have to engage with social sciences much more. And I think we have said, uh, we know of that, uh, that, uh, that need and we sort of try to include into call text uh, this sort of uh, reference that social sciences uh, should be included included as a work package there, but it always goes as a parallel stream. So I think, um, is there ways that sort of social sciences could uh, could phrase the services they can now for this immediate need that is driven by public health in the COVID context so that to make a social sciences service immediately better recognizable for implementation of sort of diagnostic uh, approaches or whatever. So I mean, um, is there a way to sort of offer services more uh, in this type of uh, research infrastructures project that we have in fund, for example, so natural sciences that uh, uh, biomedical research can pick what they need immediately there. Is there a, a space for, for helping us? Thank you. Um. Yeah, no, Vasi. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, 
I mean, that's a that's a very good point. Um, and I and I suppose the way that I think about it is it should be even in the way in which proposals are put together is is that we should begin to think in how we do projects together because there is that recognition that we can benefit from each other's insights. Um, and but also what happens is that even when um, there is some kind of social science research which usually comes in the form of qualitative research it's usually done by people who are not actual social sciences but from a team of um of of researchers within the natural sciences who believe that they can analyze um qualitative data so i think i think in building the research team in 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 approaching funders, in putting together a proposal, um, these are some some of the things that should be non-negotiable. Um, I mean, I'd also love to hear what the rest of the panel has to say. Yeah, can I actually ask directly David, because he seems to be, as a natural scientist, seems to straddle indeed the uh, different areas. Uh, how do, David, how do you manage to run a successful program integrating different disciplines um lots of practice <laughs> uh i think you know the main uh i mean it's hard right now for sure i mean what we usually try and do is make sure we build time into the process um, and we also try to make sure that we um or, or maybe to, re to start it from a slightly different perspective. Uh, I, I'm very methodologic in the work I do in terms of the way data is managed and analyzed, but I'm very applied in terms of trying to focus on real world impacts in public health. And so we always do our research in what we, we call an integrated knowledge translation approach, where we really start with the end users and we try to get them involved uh, to understand their perspectives. So in this case, people that work with global surveillance systems to monitor and, and to determine what to do about uh, global epidemics. Um, and in that context, it's, 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 it's really critical to have multiple disciplines involved from the outset because it becomes quite clear that if we take a very natural sciences perspective on the question from the outset, that we're going to create some kind of a technology artifact that uh, when we provide it to the users, it's, it's really not going to fit within their context to meet their needs and, and, uh, and really do what they need to get done. So, uh, you know, having a broader set of perspectives, uh, including social science perspectives from the outset is really important for us to understand what the problem really is, uh, what the different dimensions are of the problem and to understand the limits to some extent of the technology that we're able to use to try to address some aspects of that problem. Thank you. Any of the other speakers have a, a, a possible solution, how, what you came across to integrate the natural and the humanities and the social sciences? Apparently not, but I see that Nick Watson is uh, raising his virtual hand. Hi. Um my point it's it's slightly different to this but i, I think it, it's to do with the notion of um bringing groups together we we've, we've been doing work with uh, disabled people across the united kingdom and one of the things we found that some people now i think there's been a huge expansion of uh internet access uh, lots of third sector organizations have stepped in to improve uh, internet access for disabled people across the country but still in some areas we're finding uh, up to 60% of people don't have internet access. And in terms of research, researching and recruiting and getting hold of and, and talking to people about their experience, we're creating two groups. We get, we've got those people with internet access who we can get hold of quickly. We can interview either through Zoom or through other methods down the line and we can actually, we actually know how to contact them. And then the, the large numbers of people who aren't being included in the research and I think we're seeing the same with some of the work that's going on in the um, global south, where um, the, the replication is that we can, the global north, we can, as the, the technology, it's easier to get hold of people and to collect views of the impact of COVID. But in the global south, we're seeing the emergence of an unconnected group, and there's a danger that we're going to end up with focusing too much on those people we can contact easily, even in the global south, with the uh, expansion of the the internet and 
moving across into these different areas. And I just wondered how uh, people have been talking about the, the changes in the way that we're working and the internet, and, and this is the stuck at home, has meant that we're working in very different ways. But there's a real danger that those people that are easy to ignore become even easier to ignore because they can't get into the system at all because they don't have the internet access. Anyone want to take position to that? Wesley. Uh, just, to, just to say that's, that's uh, you know, nothing against the internet. That's actually the main object that I study, but at the, uh, I totally agree with the last speaker and that's, that's why we are very uh, committed to in-person interviews. And uh, the, um, the IRB at my university said um, it was too dangerous to do a COVID study. I needed to do it all over the internet. And we reminded him that unemployed uh, individuals or, you know, they're, they're not in Ghana, you know, in, in a slum, in Accra, are not really going to be answering my internet survey. So, uh, no, we really need to find people. We need to talk to them face to face and need to encourage them to both answer the questions that we have and elaborate uh, in, a, in a qualitative way on their own concerns. Can, can I just um, add to that? Our students have been doing some really great work using um, their phones and WhatsApp. Um, and in South Africa, a lot of people um, have mobile phones and are quite adept at using WhatsApp. Um, so we've been able to get around the internet issue through that. And if I can just add, Max, I'll say from our work too, it's been clear that uh, both from prior, prior projects as well as this one, that, that uh, this approach to global surveillance uh, has, has major holes in it in terms of the populations it reaches. Uh, obviously, it's based on news media, where news media is highly prevalent, and also what news media tends to report on, which is also uh, not always consistent. And so this is one aspect, in fact, from a social science perspective, we're trying to explore is the role of media biases and, and how global health surveillance, you know, what it picks up, how quickly it picks it up, and uh, uh, how that relates to actions that are taken. And so I think, you know, that there's a potential for a sort of negative reinforcing effect there uh, in terms of, you know, looking where the data are and then sort of trying to address problems where the data are as opposed to thinking more globally. And so that is certainly one piece of our research is trying to really uh, dig a little deeper into that issue and understand how that influences current strategies to use online media for global surveillance. Thank you, David. Um, Joanna Henderson has had her hand up. Thanks. Um, I'm from uh, Canada and funded by CIHR um, and really fortunate to be in that situation. I just wanted to echo the comments around the um, biases that exist, you know, especially when we're in a reactive and responsive mode. And I think Partly, it's a, a call to funders to really think about how to build research infrastructure to support, you know, various methodologies in advance. Obviously, we can't do it in advance of COVID, but now having learned what we've learned through this pandemic, you know, I think there's always a struggle to get the investment in research infrastructure in um, diverse contexts and to allow for diverse methodologies. And I think. Um, a comment that was before, you know, we have, so I work with youth and I do youth engaged research and youth co-led research and having youth embedded in community um, allows us to quickly respond and pivot and then use that network to reach out. So where we build capacity amongst um, lay people, community partners, uh, we can then leverage that in context where we can't maybe use some of our other um, technologies, but it, what it takes is a commitment from research funders to invest. So those are my thoughts. Anyone want to react to that? I don't see any hands, so I will just use the prerogative of the chair. Oh, 
uh, whole team. Yeah, so it's me again from the Research Infrastructures Program. Thank you for that uh, comment, uh, Joanna. There, I just would like to uh, um, to briefly reply that I think that was the point I wanted to uh, to get across. That I think maybe it could be helpful that uh, in this uh, public health crisis here, it should be the questions to be researched or should be uh, uh, um, uh, looked into. Uh, maybe should be formulated from the public health side, and it's really services that come from they are tangible and nicely recognizable as very useful and pertinent for the public health needs uh, questions uh, uh, placed there. And then I think that was this research infrastructure sort of profile where such services in a tangible way offered by social sciences rather than self-determined uh, topics uh, that are looked into uh, would be sort of on offer. I think that could be a nice way to interfacing better social sciences and uh, public health. Many thanks. Thank you. Um, one question I have uh, while waiting for uh, um, somebody else uh, to intervene is, um, how do you deal with changing goalposts? Um, every day, every week, every month there, we, will, we are looking at a new present and therefore a, a, a potential uh, a future. Now, your, your projects are clearly linked to a past, uh, very often pre-COVID past. So how do you deal with adjustments, not necessarily the technical adjustments, but especially with the funders? The funders have funded your projects based on a set of expectations. And every, every week, the, the current moment has changed and therefore, uh, maybe the gap between what you promised a while ago and what you are now looking at may widen. Um, I will start with my response. My project is is not funded, but is part of an ongoing study that I do um, in urban marginalized communities which um, started off generally with issues around uh, reproduction, both social and biological. So it's been over 20 years that I've been doing this work, which is, um, which is where I get my understanding of care and kinship. And my interest is in looking at how communities are responding to care issues within this particular health crisis, which will be part of this documentation of um, marginalized communities post-apartheid South Africa. I can add to that, Max. From our, my perspective, we, I mean, we're fortunate that the Key Institute of Health Research, when they put out their funding call for uh, COVID-19, they've had two, two rounds of funding now. But in both cases, um, you know, there was a, a targeted call in the sense that you had, you know, the, the proposal had to be on point in terms of addressing some issues that were identified, including, you know, clearly social science issues in related to COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but the funding mechanism was an operating grant, which allows the primary investigator a fair degree of latitude in terms of how they may adjust the actual research topic. Uh, in fact, almost complete latitude. So, you know, if, if the topic changes or the goalposts move a bit, uh, it's within the prerogative of the PI to, to adjust the scientific plan accordingly. Uh, there is reporting, of course, at the end, but uh, but that that's that's a very nice. Uh, they use that kind of more, I would say, sort of science framework to 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 fund it after it went through the uh, the review of being uh, you know responding to a priority, uh, which allows us then to adapt, uh, as you're pointing out, to a situation that, of course, is changing. I just received a, a time warning, so my very last, very quick question is: if you if if you had if I were a, a, a fairy that would give you three wishes and you would, uh, you could, uh, and uh, for toward funders, and if you cannot ask for more money or more time, what would you wish for? Not, mo not money, not time. What could help your research right now? Um, yeah, I think from our perspective, it would be a bit more connection with some of the public health organizations like the WHO group, uh, you know, and, and, and I totally understand their challenges uh, working in public health myself. Uh, but to the extent to which funders could try to facilitate some of those linkages 
for really, you know, operational research and data access and even feedback on questions for relevance, that would be very helpful from my perspective. Wesley, what would you like? Other yeah, my, my, my request is very specifically to WHO. I'd like to, uh, we're about ready to go into the field in 11 countries. I'd love to know if they would look at, you know, some of, some of our questions to make sure that we're going to get the information that will be helpful to them. That would be super, no money involved. Chisomo. Yeah, I, I just to follow on David and Wesley, I would say more direct open dialogue. I mean, things are changing so rapidly, you know, and there's always a protocol to follow, but we, we can't, things have to change in sense of being able to directly contact to say, this is what's going on. And, and to have some sort of forum, like, I mean, this is great, you know, and, and it's an open forum, but I think actually direct dialogue between funders and, um, and researchers, and because I think right now there's always a protocol between institutions tend to be right in the center. And so I'm not necessarily sure how that would work, but I think there needs to be open dialogue because we're just in a brave new territory right now. Very quickly, Nolwazi, what would you want if not time and money? Um, I suppose I would like access to working with people who could help um, build a different platform in which to communicate. Um, yes, yes, different ways of reaching people to um, communicate. Thank you very much. Uh, Morgan has indicated that our time is up, I believe. Morgan, if you can help me, this uh, it would be now up to the rapporteur or uh, to that's, his work. That's right. Um, I think we have just a few minutes left um, for a quick um, wrap up from our rapporteur, after which we'll have a short break and then return to the main session where we'll get a bit of a briefing from all the other conversations that have taken place and a, a larger plenary discussion. Can you hear me? Okay, so I'm gonna keep it uh, brief. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for all the, uh, the wonderful presentations and, and then the questions and, and the ideas floating and floating around. Thank you for uh, Joao, Morgan, uh, Lay, and thank you for the uh, Globepid R. So basically, uh, I think we, we, uh, the question that, uh, that uh, Max put it in, in the end, the, the three wishes that, that, you might, that you might have, they all they also trigger down to the to the idea of more dialogue. You know, uh, uh, this is what David said. You know, more dialogue with David Cho. Wesley had said exactly the same, and uh, Shizomo uh, also. In a, uh, no, as he said, you know, a, a way to communicate. So basically, we're we're clearly uh, understanding that that we need to actually uh, talk. This methodological tug of war between social sciences and biomedical sciences, you know, is currently uh, untenable. And you know, in the previous panels, if, if some of you have, have attended, there's always this uh, idea that the social uh, the social sciences are actually uh, much much needed. Um, interestingly, uh, Nawazi and and uh, Shizomo point or give us a hint of uh, or their research. If you focus on changes, change, you know, what was the before the lockdown and what's now uh, with, with, with COVID. Um, so the care does change and it changes dramatically and will change dramatically even, even more. The other interesting point that, 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 that they made is the timeline. Uh, Science, natural sciences, or, or biomedical sciences, and social sciences do not always adhere to the same timeline. So that's sort of a, it might be interesting also to kind of a, have some sort of a, a dialogue. The the other interesting thing that we that, that, that we can we can think is that there's a, 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 this idea of the concepts really matter. That is, uh, Noel said that you know uh, care. It is something that is, is not as straightforward, it's absolutely stressful. It has to, for instance, if, if you look at some examples of, of the care in the, in the uh, of some articles that, that appeared in the in, uh, long care, uh, long term care homes in, in Italy, most of them were carried out by, by migrant workers from, from, from all over the 
the place. So that's that's also interesting. Uh, David and Wesley put up a, a, a different views. They, they, they focus more on uh, on um, Wesley was pre pretty much okay. Let's see the impact of the precautions, or meaning that the facto actions that people took, that the jury, that the recommendations that the government actually uh, proposed, and in between, he said how burdensome and how necessary are these items or actions. So the idea is, you know, what we're trying to, to, to know is how do people make their choices along the lines? And, and David does that in also interesting against this hierarchy, like he called of, of, uh, um, of uh, governmental views. And, and he goes and says, we're looking for topics. We're looking for how non-pharmaceutical actions how they are implemented and the reaction that they have uh, at the community. Again, very interesting social uh, change over time because this is one of the conditions of, of the pandemic. Uh, it is not where we, um, uh, we are not in, in, in March, we're not in, in, in June, uh, sorry, we are in, in June, July, and this is changing and this is we currently uh, sort of a, um, understand that this, it's a key, a key element uh, of this and uh, I wrap it up. Thank you so much. We have seconds. Thank you.